and it'll be like a, just a moment or two as the attendees um, kind of give a few seconds to talk because you're being recorded. Yeah. Surely someone will watch this later. Uh oh, Clint's still talking. There we go. <laughs> Look at my amazing mug, everybody. I am truly outrageous today. Lovely. Also, I need to geek out one more time, Karen. The book, you're breaking me. You're oh. breaking me. <laughs> am I? <laughs> oh my god. <gosh. laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> my, uh, where are you? What chapter do you? I am about midway ish through, and then I had to do con stuff. So I'm like, son of a. Mm -hmm. bitch. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, we, Karen revels in our, our tears and excl exclamations. So. My my mom, I love my mom today. She was basically she 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 was basically she she paused and she goes, Well, I'm reading your book again and and I didn't expect it to have this 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 this, this much blood and guts in it. It was fun. Well, Karen, like, yes, mom. Come out. I think everybody's here, so I should probably stop just All right. chattering. Hello everybody. All right. So welcome to We Are All Made of Stars, Galaxy Building and Science Fiction. I'm your moderator, Clarissa. Um, we have a large and uh, experienced and hopefully opinionated uh, panel. Um, so I'm going to start with the land acknowledgement and then you can do your introductions. Um, and then we'll move on to our uh, very large topic, our galaxy spanning topic of conversation. So uh, I'm hosting this panel from Robocon's home region, which is the Binghamton, New York metro area. And so I want to acknowledge our presence in the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, in particular the Onondaga Nation, who continue to live in and steward this land. And you can learn more about them at onondaganation.org. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to introductions. Uh, Clarissa, she, her, um, and let's go on on, on my screen. Karen is next, clockwise. So, introduction. Okay. Hi, my name's Karen Osborne. I am the author of Architects of Memory, which uh, just came out um, a couple weeks ago. It's available anywhere books are sold. Uh, it's, it's about a salvage crew that comes across a very, very, very scary and dangerous alien weapon and what happens to and what happens to our main character uh, as she deals with that and tries to um, find a cure for her terminal illness. So uh, it is available wherever books are sold. I've got uh, stories in Uncanny, uh, in Fireside, and a whole bunch of places. And I, build, I love building galaxies, and I love building worlds, and I, and I can't wait to chat with all of you. OK, um, so uh, next, let's move on to Jay. Hey. Uh, I'm J.R.H. Lawless. I'm a dual national French and Canadian uh, science fiction humor author coming from the foggy coast of Atlantic Canada there currently. Um, I'm, uh, so I'm a debut novelist this year with two books that came out in the middle of the pandemic, uh, Always Greener, which was the first one, and uh, The Rude Eye Rebellion, which came out just last week. And um, so those are, it's a series about, briefly put, uh, absurd future reality show combined with Marxist revolution theory and etymology jokes. Cool. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, and then next we've got Tyler. Hey all, um, pleasure to be here. I'm Tyler Hayes. Uh, I am a speculative fiction writer. Um, I've had short fiction published in a variety of places, online and in print. I'm best known for my fantasy noir novel, The Imaginary Corpse, which is available right now wherever books are sold. Um, I am coming to you from stolen Narragansett land that is now known as Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and it, this is gonna be a fascinating panel for me because I am mostly a fantasy author uh, and on the softer side of sci-fi and science fantasy when I do it. But I think I've got some, in, some valuable input from that corner. Great, thank you. And next, Ted. Uh, hi, my name's Ted Weber. Um, I currently live in Annapolis, Maryland, which was originally Piscataway territory. Um, I write novels and short stories in different genres, but mostly speculative fiction. Uh, the final book of my near future cyberpunk trilogy, Zero Day Rising, is coming out October 1st, just a few days from now on C Sharp Press. Uh, first two books are Sleep State Interrupt and The Wrath of the Leviathan, and they're available at um, all online outlets. So um, 
it's basically a giant media corporations taking over the internet, created an addictive virtual reality, and they control nearly all information on behalf of a privileged few. Uh, and uh, an unemployed bipolar journalist or VR addicted otaku sister and a teenage hacker try to end the corporation's control of the world and bring about a better future. And I also have some other books uh, in various stages of completion. Great, thank you, Todd. And uh, you might want to know that there's somebody behind you. <laughs> All right. All right, Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Miles. I'm coming to you from the Washington, D.C. area. Um, I write a variety of science fiction and fantasy, and I have short stories out in places including Strange Horizons, Analog, uh, Nature Futures, and coming out in a couple months in Fireside. And Space Opera is my jam, so I'm excited for this conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, this is a very large topic. Um, uh, so I have a bunch of specific questions to ask about making non-human species and uh, storytelling conventions and so on. But um, just in terms of general world building, um, is there anything that, that, you know, does anybody have a thought about world building that you are holding on to and would like to release uh, into the ether as it were? Uh, the one that ruined a couple stories of mine. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I I went to um, I went to uh, Clarion, uh, which is a writing workshop uh, that's about six weeks long. It's amazing, and one of my teachers there was Corey Doctorow, and uh, Corey told us mm. that there are always a few things in stories that you can't mess around with. And one of the things about writing a story or making a world is figuring out what those things are um, before, before you begin. Uh, his example was um, computers. Everyone has a computer in their pocket. They know how it works. You basically know how a computer works. So if you go up against a computer that's doing something um, differently than what you than what you kind of understand then um it's not going to work for the reader and the reader really won't know why and and so they'll they'll, they'll kind of like bounce off what 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 you're trying to do so sometimes that's physics sometimes that's biology sometimes that's psychological science but um one of the things that i think writers have to do in their world building is figure out what what are the unbreakable rules that i can't do much with mm -hmm. Yeah. If I could um, just butt in, um, so there's sort of two types of world building. One is you can call hard world building, which is kind of what um, Karen's talking about, um, where you make sure you get the facts straight, get the physics right, um, you know, get the uh, computers um, right, um, all that sort of stuff. And then there's soft world building, like um, um, Miyazaki's uh, uh, films like Spirited Away and um, and then like a lot of um, what I would call science fantasy like Star Wars and, and books like that where they just play you know the you know loose and fast with the rules because in, in soft world building it's telling the story and then the characters are um, the main focus and the world building it can almost be um, expressionistic. And whereas hard world building is more, um, it's more grounded in reality, more grounded in science and more grounded in facts. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Um, I wanted, yeah. yeah, I just had something, a corollary to that. But I think it's still important to have internal consistency, which is what I really wanted to bring up is that world building is both about giving the human reader something that they can connect with um it's why you can't it's why you have what comic book people call reed richards is useless because if all those super genius inventors actually got to just completely go ham you would create a world no one recognizes where you have to explain everything in order to show them just doing day-to-day -day interactions but back to the other thing is also even star wars with the exception of the expanded universe which is a whole or something legends Sorry, that's what it's called now. Um, it, 
uh, is internally consistent, but there is the issue of authors kind of accreting stuff onto Star Wars as those novels were on. But like lightsabers work basically the same way, and there's an understood explanation of how a lightsaber and the Force and the dark side work. Um, now those are all kind of soft, like you say. You know, the, we take for granted. Oh, the Force is a mystical force that Jedi can use, but we don't necessarily take for granted that it can do anything. Yeah. Um, you know, what it can do is fairly defined, though some of it's kind of loose. And that was a whole issue, obviously, with the, oh, sorry, go, I don't want to do that. Um, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, that's the whole issue, obviously, with the latest movie, and which breaks a lot of that internal, and the one before it, which breaks so much of that internal consistency, uh, while still having so many awesome story things. Uh, for me, to just quickly, in terms of world building, the only thing I wanted to say, which is kind of my, uh, uh, my my pet domain, I suppose, or what I what I pay a lot of attention to, as also a lawyer for my sins when I'm not writing, uh, is legal systems in our science fiction worlds and universes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the corollary, which is obviously political systems. There's a lot of attention on political systems, and that's great. But legal systems sometimes gets a little bit neglected, and mm -hmm. I think it's just as important that that be consistent and that it not be operating on um, sort of uh, assumptions. And, you know, just like, oh, things will always be the same as today. No, there's, you know, legal systems translate uh, power relationships in all sorts of areas. And they need, it's, it's a really good opportunity to have conscious choices to serve your story and your character's development. Um, I wanted to dig in a little more to something that Ted said. I really like the phrase um, expressionistic for mm -hmm. describing the, that softer kind of world building. Um, I think that's that's in some ways a nicer way of talking about like the iceberg principle of world building that um, we talk about where you've, you've got a little bit of world building that shows up in your novel, but then there's all this world um, that's not on the page, but you need to know. And that's where the internal consistency comes in because novels are big, worlds are big, spaces to paraphrase Douglas Adams, I think space is really, really, really big. There's going to be so much out there in your universe when you're writing a story set in space. So picking the, the details that you want to include that are supporting your story, but also showing the diversity and breadth of the universe that you're working in, whether that's a detail about a legal system or showing a a glimpse of an alien that doesn't breathe oxygen and how you incorporate different environments onto your space station to deal with that. Just these like little um, like colorful details can help flesh out the world and create a sense of that breadth, even though you don't have space to include all of that in the novel. And that yeah, also so comes to, sorry, Clarissa, no, you no, first. Go on. I was going to say the other side of so the other side of the iceberg trick for me is that it's a way to get away with not having to fall down some certain rabbit holes when world building yep. is if you can get enough detail that you give the impression that there is more you could know but there's not space to talk about it um, then you can get away with again as long as you have internal consistency in the narrative you're not pulling you know, uh, in the legal system example, you're not suddenly pulling an obscure law out of nowhere that allows the main character to get out of their predicament. Um, but you don't need to know every detail as long as you know what's on the page and a little bit past that and you hint that there's more to know. So that actually gets uh, really well connected to a, a private question I just got, um, which was about uh, doing your world building when do you do it? How much do you do it? Um, so do you do your world building before you start writing or during? Do you just fill in the gaps later? How much do you need before you start? And I personally have noticed a tendency among very new writers to, to think that they have to fill up a Tolkien style binder before they set down a single word, especially if it's space opera um, or, or high fantasy. And, and I feel like that can be dangerous, but uh, everybody's different. So anybody want to talk about when you do it and how much do you need to know? I, I did do talk? that sort of Bible thing for um, uh, one book, which is um, still in sort of limbo. Uh, I completed, but in limbo. And I created, a, I don't know if you're familiar with the travel guides like Lonely Planet and Rough Guide, but I created a rough guide to the realm that it was set in. And um, I found that that was that was pretty helpful when um, to create the world first and um, to um, that way the characters would 
would fit into it because um, a person's environment and culture partially shapes the way that they are. And it also uh, shapes the plot somewhat. Um, but, but most of my other books are set on Earth, so I don't have quite as much work to do. Um, but I do do, so, I do some research, but it's usually as it pops up in the scene. And then I, um, I either run it by experts or, or talk to experts, for, like friends, um, J.R. Rachel's mentioning lawyer, uh, the legal systems. So I, um, so my second uh, book of the cyberpunk trilogy, Wrath of Leviathan, um, there's a lot of um, uh, legal um, uh, elements, both in the US and in Brazil. And so I had to research those. I sat in the Maryland Law Library and then I, um, I ran it by legal experts in the US and Brazil. Yes. And so, uh, You're I'm making me very happy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I tried to be accurate, Chair H. Um, so because I'm an environmental scientist, so I automatically tend to be a stickler for accuracy. So I kind of fall in the hard world building category. Cool. All right. Anybody else want to talk about when and how much? My, my, my world building philosophy comes from Stargate. Um, basically, uh, at the beginning, Stargate could go anywhere to anything. Like, like literally, you open the Stargate, and what's on the other side? You don't know. And at the end, you had characters just going off, oh, we're going to see this guy again, we're going to see this guy again. And the sense of wonder was just, just gone. Like, you couldn't, you couldn't, like you couldn't really get into it because it was all explained. Everything was all there. And so like what Tyler said about leaving a bit of, a, a bit of um, stuff there, that's what I try to do. So you start with the characters. What do they need? Where are they? What systems are they working in? How do they interface with the systems? Um, and then you can fill in the back from there. Um, once again, you have your, your unchangeables, but like, it's okay to leave a lot open because you're going to need to leave outdoors for yourself because uh, you're going to run into places in the novel, even if you plan it immensely to, 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 the, to the letter um, about what you want to do. You're going to run into places where you're going to find yourself in a corner and you're going to need some space to sort of maneuver yourself out. And also you can, um, as you go, but you also need enough to like um, give yourself sort of a, okay so my character is standing in front of a a cargo door what does the cargo door look like how does it work how does it interact with the atmosphere you need to know stuff like that too um to in, in order so like environmental stuff but like don't go too far don't go too far right in the beginning because it it just it, it sometimes becomes more of a problem than than a than a solution yeah, yeah I have found myself going, oh, wait, well, I can't have this problem prop, prop up because I put in this limitation. And then, you know, like three days later, I'm like, wait, wait, yeah. I'm God. <laughs> no. You know, I can just take that out. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, I'm God. <laughs> hey, Jay, you wanted to add something? Oh, well, I'm just going to say that. Sorry. I'm just going to say that my process is exactly what Karen is describing as well. You know, yes, you have, you know, you have vague ideas, all that pleasure of brainstorming and world building elements at the, right at the beginning before you start drafting and you're putting all these elements together. It's great, but that those are resources and you know, that you can't, I find in terms of process, I mean, obviously everyone's mileage varies, but, uh, or kilometer, kilometer age, but, um, you know, you can't, uh, you can't lock yourself in that much. Uh, I think the first time I ever wrote a book Bible, and again, it's not really a Bible was that, two days ago when my agent asked for one, like a graphic style one for us to send uh, on so for a book that's going on submissions. So. I was yeah. gonna add uh, to what Karen said. Sorry, Joe, you were about to say something. I didn't mean to no, step go, on go ahead. Okay, but also if I, I feel like I need to think through everything my characters, my POV character or characters would know about the world, they're in, the world or worlds they're interacting with. Um, so that it feels like they actually inhabit that world and they aren't all seeing everything for the first time. Um, you know, like, like Karen says, if I have a character who works on a spaceship crew, they know how the, I, the writer need to know how the doors to the spaceship work. And I need to write them like they know how the doors to the spaceship work and explain that from the perspective of a 
knowledgeable character not stopping and giving you you know like a powerpoint presentation on how the pressure locks work um but also thinking through the implications of what i'm putting into my world building so that i don't trap myself was what karen made me think of you know you run into the problem with um like a really like heavy-handed example is the sonic screwdriver in doctor who where they kept ascribing more and more properties to the sonic screwdriver to the point where then they had to make up ways to stop the sonic screwdriver because otherwise the doctor solved every problem by pointing the sonic screwdriver at it but then later writers let him overcome that obstacle so they had to do other things and it got out way out of control yeah doesn't work on wood doesn't work on wood wait a sec what the hell is that wood door and it works all of a sudden <laughs> joe we're gonna add something um, yeah, I, my process is also pretty similar to Karen's. I like to work in layers, so I figure out the, the biggest things at the beginning um, rooted in the, the point of view character's background and where they're starting out in the universe and kind of go from there. I might know like some big picture details about the places they're going to visit or the cultures um, and then flesh out the details as we get there. But one thing that I really do like to try to think about upfront or ahead of time is anything where I want to be challenging my own basic assumptions about the, how the world works as a you know, white uh, raised female person in the United States. Um, do I want to have a different political system, a different gender system, a different class system than what we have here? Um, especially things like like gender and how people relate to each other, family structures, thinking about those things ahead of time has huge implications for how characters relate to each other. And if you don't step back and think about those things before you dive in writing, you're going to fall back on your own assumptions and your background and where you come from. So I think if you want to create worlds that really feel different than the one that we inhabit, um, thinking through some of those very basic assumptions before you get started is really important. So we've got two questions that um, relate to different aspects of what we've just been talking about. I'm just going to take them in order. Um, so the first one is from Gaia3, who says, um, how do you all manage to keep track of that internal consistency? Um, where do you, so like, uh, where do you uh, keep track of your world building? Like Post-its on the wall? Badly. <laughs> <laughs> Scrivener for my sins. That's where um, that um, rough guide came in handy that I created mm -hmm. because I could always look back at it. Um, like I even went down to the level, and this is like got totally out of hand, and it's, and it's actually why I started mostly writing books set on Earth, where they had it was like a gesture-based system rather than just spoken language. So I came up with all these different gestures and what they meant and all that, and so that was part of the rough guide. But then at, at some point I realized. Oh, this has gotten out of control. I'm not doing this again. Yeah, I, I have a Word doc um, that I, so I work in Word like a heathen. Um, and uh, I have a Word doc I keep separate from my manuscript where I write down world building notes to myself um, as I establish them, wh whether I'm drafting or like I have to make something up as I'm uh, you know, outlining or whatever, I'll write down, you know, okay, uh, I am assuming this political system because of some of the things that I've said. Remember that you've said it is a constitutional monarchy or, you know, remember that you've said magic can't do X or something like that. Um, and so I just kind of keep that rolling tally. And then occasionally as I get deeper into a manuscript, I'll go, wait a minute, what did I say about the place that character's from again? Hold on, okay, there we go. Um, but it's very much a living document and how detailed it gets varies from topic to topic. Occasionally it really is just the sonic screwdriver can't affect wood. And occasionally it is here is a dissertation on how the sonic screwdriver works. Jay, did you yeah. wanna add something? Well, just that that's, you know, that's, that's where the magic of editing, you know, comes in uh, and fixes so many things. I mean, even just in terms of basic consistency, I remember one of my worst examples is uh, the whole climax of one of my books uh, that's also currently with my agent uh, was um, in this base under the ice of Enceladus in microgravity. And I'd established it was microgravity and had other scenes in microgravity earlier in the book. But for some reason, people were walking around 100% normally on inside, inside this base of Enceladus. And so I ended up having to completely redo it. And I, and I had fun with it. And I had them floating and slamming into things. And it was great. Once I'd fixed it. But, you know, it was just one of those. 
I, th I think you can take it for granted that you're going to have inconsistencies in your first draft. And oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that's the importance of having been in critique groups and having and also having beta readers that um, hopefully they'll spot these things. Um, like in my cyberpunk series, I uh, have one character that has this cat and it magically changed gender in the story. <laughs> Someone pointed out, your cat changed gender. Oh, dope. Yeah, it really helps to have a different set of eyes because uh, we tend to write. I mean, we, we have the, the, what they call the curse of knowledge, right? We know so much about the story. We're maybe not seeing what's actually there. Um, I do know of other people who have made like a private wiki to keep track of their details. Um, and people do use the, the printed out binder. Um, it just depends on how your brain works. I use Scrivener because I'm very disorganized. And that way when I'm typing, I can highlight a phrase. Like I just put in, uh, you know, Marissa's parents are dead. I highlight that and just send it to, to a, automatically append to a document I have about Marissa. Um, or Marissa. That's clever. For Marissa. Like that. <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. Okay. So uh, then um, Joe asks, uh, would you equate alien species creation in sci-fi similar to fantasy in that you take human as a baseline and compare each race as to how they differ uh, or compare to humans? So elves, dwarves, gnomes, Klingons, Vulcans, Gorns. <laughs> as an ecologist, I'll just have to say that's one of my pet peeves is humanoid aliens. I, I think that they would be so incredibly different from that from us uh, that they would be you know, hard to recognize. They they may not even be DNA based. Yeah, I see sort of like two like schools of aliens, at least in written sci-fi, and I like them both for different reasons. There's like the the sort of Star Trek, Star Wars inspired, like everybody is kind of based on that human baseline, and we can all like talk to each other because we all use spoken language and we all have you know similar enough anatomy and gestures and ways of interacting with the universe that we can get along and like work together through our cultural differences um, and then you have like the really alien aliens which you can do really well in writing and it's harder to do when things like tv because you don't need a special effects budget when you're writing but i really love like um in elizabeth bear's um Ancestral Night, her recent space opera, she has some incredible aliens that um, people are like, we, we think these are sentient, we can't communicate with them, we have reasons to, these are the reasons that we think that they're a, an evolved form of life, but we can't even talk to them enough to be sure of that. And then there's everything um, in between on the spectrum. I, this is, this is my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I I read Bear's book and I just went ah, all the way through because it's just a great it's a great example of pretty much everything that happens in this area. Um, when I was writing Architects of Memory, I wanted to make them as far away from humans as possible. I wanted to make the war that they just all go, go gone through like completely unexplainable like why did this happen we don't know we can't know because we again we can't talk with them so what i ended up doing was whenever i came up with a assumption i'd be like okay so they have fingers why would they have fingers um if they don't have fingers what do they have but why would they have that and i just kind of chased that um um i kind of chased that uh that uh, rat down the hole for a little bit um, until I ended up in Wonderland, um, the rabbit down the hole. And, um, but at the same time, it is actually hung on a human structure. And I can't say more than that because that's a spoiler, but um, I, as a, I, as a writer needed something to hang it on. I needed a, I needed a, um, a coat stand for my jacket. So <laughs> Um, there is a coat stand for the jacket, but I, it's, I, I think it's more fun to try to, but I mean, once again, I do love Star Trek and it, it, sometimes it's, that's just the best way to tell a story where someone is just that furthest away from you where you can say things um, that you, or, or, or entertain ideas or go places that you wouldn't normally be able to go. And then uh, Star Trek came up with a reason why they all looked similar that they had the had this yeah. uh, gene, uh, where they 
this race that spread the genes around her. Yeah, see, that's yeah, too much it's, world building it's for it's me. Not, no, too yeah. much. I that did not need that. that. <laughs> yeah, because it was also, like an afterthought, uh, though. Yeah, well, and, and also just you, the, the science has an excuse for this. If we are assuming that all these creatures are DNA based and dealing with Earth like environments, if we're assuming that Earth in like environments are the only place life evolves, mm -hmm. Bicameral, ten-digited, bipedal creatures with big brain cases are kind of just evolution favors them in those environments. There's a reason humans yeah. manage to take over the entire planet. Um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this I, question. That's totally fine. I, I, I want to say I totally, I totally agree with what Tyler's saying there, but also I think that doing sometimes it's okay just to do things in science fiction because they're oh. fun and they don't need to have a scientific basis. Like both of those things are yeah. true. Yeah. And yeah. Evolution, uh, yeah. evolution isn't um, deterministic. It, it is uh, based on what came before it and uh, it's random and um, uh, environmentally adaptive. So the fact that we have, we and other mammals have four finger five digits um, is purely a coincidence that our common ancestor did, and so we do. It's just we could just as easily have four or six or ten. Um, yeah, either. I think the point is that some of these things are sort of storytelling conventions that make right. it tell a certain type of story easier. So, like uh, ansibles, faster than light travel, oh. yeah. um, ignoring yeah. time dilation. Like, yeah. there's reasons to do that if it serves your story. Wormholes. Mm -hmm. and one of one of my favorite stories about wormholes comes from um, Arkady Martin, who who uses them in her um, in her books uh, as mountain passes and places to engender conflict. That's, oh, that's why there cool. are wormholes in those books. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I really like um, as far as um, uh, alien species. I don't know if you're all familiar with uh, David Brin, his um, Uplift War Universe. But there are many different species and they're all highly varied, but the sentient species are all, have all been adopted by some other species and sort of shaped by that other species, so there's some commonality. So that way you have a common, um, although very dysfunctional, um, culture of sorts, uh, but they, are, they fill every sort of imaginable environmental niche because they're based on um, something that arose by accident on their particular planet. But, so they can still work with each other and communicate, but they're different. So um, speaking of, of basing things on a human template, um, you know, when you're designing non-human characters, how do you avoid, uh, you know, some of the pitfalls? So for example, um, space samurai and other sort of lazy and harmful allegories of real world earth cultures. Um, Colonialism. The, the infamous, yeah. Planet of Hats syndrome, um, which if anybody in the audience isn't familiar with it, it's when, you know, <laughs> this is a planet where they wear hats. This is, this is the ice planet, this is the fire planet. This is the pleasure planet. Um, everybody, uh, there's no uh, interspecies uh, diversity or individual differences. Earth used to be a, a planet of hats. <laughs> um, so to that point, I like, the flip answer is don't do that. Um, but the but the real answer is like be aware that that is a pitfall I can fall into. Um, and as I'm doing my world building, especially my culture building and my species building and all that, like really sit and think, okay, what what cultures am I am I unconsciously perhaps pulling this from, or what cultures will people map onto this? that I might be falling into harmful tropes of. So like, mm -hmm. I might try to avoid the space samurai, but if I start using, um, I don't want to try to think of any because so many of them are harmful, but if I start using things that I realize people will map Japanese culture onto a nation that I have created, I need to make absolutely sure I'm not doing a bunch of stereotypical space samurai or everyone's a ninja or anything like that, um, you know, and, uh, I will want to not do it for myself and also be aware of, okay, well, if you, if people might read these guys as Japanese, know not to do the stuff that we kept doing to Japanese people in stories for, for over a hundred years when I do that. Yeah. yeah, cliches and stereotypes are a sign of laziness. And um, as writers, um, especially science fiction writers, we need to be imaginative. That's why people read science fiction is for... Um, mm -hmm to um, 
you know, being in a match that in a someplace different that's um, interesting. So if, if we're uh, writing something that's cliched and stereotyped, it's just bad writing. This is where the I sorry, sorry, Joe, go ahead. Um, I was going to add. So those are really good points for thinking about like how the whole culture should not be um, derivative of a Earth culture, and then creating diversity within the culture is really important. So no planet, no species is going to have just one culture or type of people in it. Um, and there's a, a trick um, I learned in the, the writing the other class that's intended for representing um, human diversity, which is if you have a, a human character in a story who is the only example of their gender or race or nationality or ability or whatever, um, you risk them coming off as either a stereotype or making statements about that kind of person. But if you have multiple people fitting within that identity, show that they're different, then you're showing that they're all unique individuals. And the same thing applies to aliens. If you have a a person in political power, they're gonna have assistants who come from maybe a different social class and different background. You're gonna have people from different cities who have slightly different cultures. And if you show even just a handful of people from that supposed monolithic culture interacting with each other and show that they have differences between them, that's gonna help make it feel more real. Yeah, and that's exactly because that's where the that's where the um, iceberg can help you. I, I know I've spent like this whole time just going, uh, don't don't world build too much. But this is where world building a lot can help you because, um, for uh, for example, um, I never get into in the. I, I, sorry, I hate saying in my novel, you know, but I'm I'm gonna do it. Fine, <laughs> do it. Uh, <laughs> um, in I, there are a whole bunch of companies and I know where they're all from. I know where they were founded by which culture, by what people. Um, and I know, and I wrote their histories. Like I wrote like a little bit about what they do and um, where they recruited on, on earth. Um, so that's, so, so having that iceberg below to refer to can help you, can help you not rely on harmful, harmful tendencies if you're just keeping, if you're, if you're keeping yourself, um, if you're keeping yourself um, uh, responsible for your own stuff. We had a, um, a private comment in the chat saying, please don't make your good guys white and bad guys black. Um, definitely think I run into. You, you would think so and yet it does not unfortunately yeah. um, because it's so baked in in the culture yeah. that we're all coming from and it's easy to fall into without even realizing you've done it like yes absolutely there's the obvious don't literally make the good guys all in white and the bad guys all in black and yet but that also, still happens <laughs> it still happens and also like so many of our words that mean sinister also yeah. mean dark or black like dark magic and fell magic and stuff like that all comes yeah. back to words for things being dark. It's been a struggle for me because I'm like, I want to consciously not do this. Crap, what do I call the evil magic? Yeah. And it comes all from, right. yeah. it, it doesn't come from skin color, it comes from our um, innate fear of the dark, you know, when we're. Um, but that still has splash damage because it's been used to prop up white supremacy. Exactly. Anyway. Mega splash damage. Uh, yeah, splash damage is real. Um, all right, so we have a question that's very specific, but I want to broaden it a little bit. And that's going to be our last question. Um, and afterwards, uh, panelists, if you can uh, put your uh, contact information and everything um, into the chat here, or even better, into the uh, writing channel on the Discord, um, that would be great. Um, and any other references you want to make or anything else. So we have a specific question from Joe about when it's appropriate to do like long distance uh, ship to ship uh, type battles in space or close combat. Um, are there reasons to do those different scales of conflict? And I would broaden that a little bit to say that protagonists in uh, science fiction stories and space opera tend to either be like little fish in a vast pond like the Wayfarers series um, or maybe uh, maybe Ancestral Night, um, or uh, I would say um, uh, Architects of Memory, um, uh, or they're, you know, sort of galaxy-shaking characters like in Machineries of Empire or, or Empress of Forever. So 
where how do you figure out the scale of, of a story when you have so many choices? But it is really, really, really big. And if that's a bad question, mm. you can change. No, it's okay. not a bad question. <laughs> I, I think the answer is, well, what do you want to do? And I know, again, it sounds flip, but what I mean is like every story has an appropriate scale to tell it at or multiple appropriate scales, but you're telling slightly different versions of that story. Like Machineries of Empire, to bring that up, it, it, you have these galaxy shaking characters, but at core, at least Nine Fox Gambit, I have not yet caught up and read further because my TBR is so huge. Um, in Nine Fox Gambit, a lot of it is about the personal perspectives of those two main characters on this huge galaxy shaking thing. And I think both of those scales matter. Um, their personal perspectives are very powerful in light of this huge scale that they're fighting at. Um, and I think that the story of, I've completely forgotten both their names, Jed Ao and the other character. Um, Karis. Thank you. Um, would be different if they had chosen to focus on personal combat. Um, and would yet again be different if we had made them less powerful, if they had been grunts in this fight instead of being on a more st uh, strategic level with how they are grappling with it. So my, my personal preference is I like to read stories about the grunts, about the common people um, embroiled in a larger conflict. Um, so my books tend to have um, a large conflict going on and the characters are relatively normal, unempowered people that um, uh, grow over time and um, gain the ability to affect that larger um, world or universe. Uh, maybe not all at all by completely by themselves, but can be a, a spark or something or or a major influence, like my cyberpunk series. They were major influence mm -hmm. um, and um, I have a um, uh, an alternate history book where the the main character it's all it's about so the whole world is basically run by uh, fascist governments but it's all set in a small town in southern Illinois that's a microcosm of the larger world so that's another way to okay. do it. All right we've got three minutes left so what's you haven't spoken um, yet. My first my 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 first book is people that don't fight my second book is people that do and it was a very different experience yep that was succinct <laughs> Anybody else? two minutes <laughs> that's all i can say <laughs> yeah so just try super quick uh distance uh you referenced military science fiction uh michael mame i think on dan Koble's blog did an amazing article on that uh, based on his personal experience in the large fire and his craft. So definitely recommend that, about why 99% of what we read is completely rubbish. And uh, two, uh, it's super important, for, particularly for legal systems, and it's one of the biggest traps you could fall down, is not taking into account distance or just sweeping distance. You know, we talk about ansibles, we talk about, uh, I will put the article in, yes, the link uh, answering to chat. Um, uh, you know, like, uh, like take Star Wars, for example, you know, the whole political consequences of having communication uh, that does not, you know, ha does not have a time lag. And then you can just, you know, instantly, you know, hollow somebody uh, through the hollow net anywhere that has huge consequences that are not taken into account. Mm -hmm. Joe, did you get to the... No, I'm good. Wow. You're good? All right. Um, so in our remaining 90 seconds or so, um, what is a field of study that you think writers should read up on uh, more uh, in their world building? And so for me, I would say uh, linguistics and human geography or social geography. I, I would say, well, as an ecologist, of course, I'm going to say ecology, but um, also a little bit about um, geology um, and definitely sociology. Physics and psychology. Physics is a good one. Uh, political systems. Yeah. Jay? Definitely agree there. No, nothing to add. That's oh, perfect. Good. All right. Um, well, thank you, everybody. And there's a bunch of links over in the chat sidebar. We will also try to um, get everybody into the, the Discord if possible. If you have more questions, um, you can ask them there. I don't know how long folks can, can hang around. Um, I have to go on to another panel immediately. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, check out everybody's books and stories, please. And uh, look forward to seeing more of everyone.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Pleasure Thank meeting everybody I hadn't yet. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks all. Thank you.